Good evening and welcome to the Word and Sword TV broadcast coming to you live from Hickory, North Carolina, WHKY Studios. We thank you for your time tonight and we hope that you'll get your Bibles. Be ready to study with us as we go through a study of the changes in our lives as we go through our lives where we are. And <clears throat> we talked about in the last program, we talked about childhood. We talked about the teenage years and how difficult those are. And now we're going to be talking tonight about the adult years <clears throat> and things in that are particular challenges. The Bible actually addresses all these subjects. So if you have your Bible tonight, uh, please get it out and follow along with us as we go through in just a moment. We want you to, uh, to make you aware of the program and what it's all about. This is a live broadcast. And we would urge you to call us, if you will, at 828-485-5555. The operators are standing by right now. And we would urge you to, to call us at that any, any time during the program. <clears throat> if you'd like to leave a question with them, and they'll get it to me by the time the program is as it goes on, uh, we will do that. And if you would like to come on live onto the air, we would be glad to, to do that. You can call and ask for a copy of this presentation in data form or PC. Pardon me, I got a, some of that pollen allergy, so, so sorry. And also you can ask for a free Bible correspondence course or a free tract or ask to be added to the Beacon mailing list, which is the church bulletin for the Newton Church of Christ. Or we would like for you, if you would, if you'd like for us to study with you, to arrange a personal Bible study with us, and we would appreciate that. <clears throat> Also, the website is www.wordandsword.com, and you can call, pardon me again, uh, you can call with a biblical question or comment and receive a biblical answer, uh, book, chapter, and verse. And if we can't get that to you tonight, we will take your name and get some, some material to you on a more continual basis, a more exhaustive basis as we go through. The, you can also like us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash word and sword and leave a question there if you will or just like us or unlike us or whatever you'd like to do. And also www.facebook.com slash Newton North Carolina Church of Christ. And also you can follow us on Twitter at word and sword <clears throat> and post a Bible question or comment on all of these and we'll be sure to get back with you to answer your Bible question. Uh, there's no need to wonder uh, about what the Bible teaches or what it says. Uh, we can all know the truth, and it is the truth that sets us free. We will not uh, give you an answer that is our opinion. We will uh, deal with what the Bible says and what it teaches. Tonight, as we go through our program, if you would be uh, willing, then call in at 828-485-5555. Five, five. And that number will be scrolling on the left, uh, right bottom of your screen as we go through this program tonight. We invite you to attend the assemblies of the Newton Church of Christ uh, at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. Regular assembly times are at 930 for Bible study, 11 o'clock for worship, and Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. And they, you'd be most welcome guest if you would come and be a part of the services there. The Word and Sword is brought to you totally, wholly, and completely by the Newton Church of Christ. And it is fully funded by the Newton Church of Christ. We do not want you to send us any money. Uh, this program is bought and paid for by the, con by the congregation at Newton, uh, North Carolina, and has been that way for over 30 years, uh, closer to 40 right now. So uh, we would urge you to, to go by and visit with the Newton Church of Christ. You can contact us also in other forms if you don't want to use computer format. You can just contact us by email at contact at wordandsword.com or you can just call the building at 828-465-3009 or you can just write a letter. Uh, P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina at 28658. And uh, we also would like to make you aware of the Bible correspondence courses that are available to you also. And that is, again, everything we offer on the program here is free of charge. And we urge you to utilize these resources, www.wordandsword.com. If you have not gone to that site, we urge you to do that. 
Uh, there's a multitude of information there, just a mass of information of different subjects, Bible subjects that you might want to hear over the past years. We've been on the, on the uh, air, and uh, we would urge you to visit that site, www.wordandsword.com, and uh, <clears throat> be aware that all of that stuff is for your own use. We just ask you that you would not change any of it, but present it as is. The most important question in the Bible and in life is what must I do to be saved? Because salvation is what we're all trying, striving for, isn't it? A home in heaven? Well, the Bible's very clear. God has a plan. The initial part of that plan is that through His grace He has sent His Son to die on the cross for us. And that, that through His grace that all men can be saved. God so loved the world He gave His only Son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We must hear that story. We must know who Jesus Christ is. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. In John 8, verse 24, Romans 10, 10, Galatians 3, 26, and Hebrews 11, 6, all of them speak to the subject of faith and how it's impossible to please God without faith and also the importance of faith. Unless we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, we'll all die in our sins, Jesus said. And it is with the mouth that the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, must be made. But I want to hasten to tell you that that is not all it takes. And we're going to talk in just a moment about some of these things. In Luke 13, 3, we know that we must repent. Jesus told that, told them that. In Acts 2, 38 and Acts 17, 30, Again, the stressing of repentance from our sins, our past sins, is absolutely essential for our salvation. Again, the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If we confess Him before men, Jesus says in Matthew 10, 32, He'll confess us before His Father in heaven. And we also know that we must be baptized in order to be saved. Not because we are saved, but in order to be saved. For the remission of our sins, not in our sins. And we know in 1 Peter 3.21 <clears throat> that baptism is likened there and is talked about as the interrogation of uh, uh, we don't have a clean conscience before God until we have been baptized because it is the act of baptism that puts us into Christ where salvation is. Galatians 3.27 says we put Christ on in baptism. Can't be saved without Christ. How do I get in Christ? Galatians 3.27, I put Him on in water baptism, where I received that blood that was shed for my sins. And then I need to be faithful to the Lord. I need to be faithful to the commandments and the precepts He's given me in the New Testament, both by direct command, or necessary inference, and approved apostolic example. The authority of Scripture must be behind the things that I practice and I teach. We also know in Acts 2 and verse 47 that when you are baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, <clears throat> that the Lord adds you to His church. And then you join yourself to a local congregation of people that are doing the things that God has commanded His people to do together. And that is absolutely essential. You can't have Christ without the church. You can't be in Christ and never go to church services. And then you must go to the right church services because the Lord only has one church. That's pleasing to Him. Matthew 16 and verse 18, it's His. It's not named after any man. People that belong to it are Christians, and the church is of Christ. It belongs, denotes ownership, it belongs to Him. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, we are told there that we must be faithful until death, and we'll receive the crown of life. Well, we've had a, this is the lesson that we'll be on here in just a moment, but let's pause and deal with the question that was asked over in Lincolnton by some by an individual who said that sin will not take you to hell. And he gave gave one of our members over that way. He gave him a tract that said sin will not condemn you to hell. Well, now let me ask you something. What do you think about that? They went on to say that what condemns you to hell is not doing what God told you to do. Well, what is not doing what God told you to do? Isn't that sin? Sin is a violation of the law. And when we violate the law, we're under the penalty of the law. 
If we die in that state, we're lost. So why are we lost? We're lost because we are disobedient to God. Is that a sin or is it not? Is that a sin? Is it a sin not to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. Sins and iniquities have separated us from God. It is a sin issue that brings forth death spiritually for all, for all of us. And so we need to know where we stand before God and sin will continue to separate us from God. If we do that which is wrong, we'll not inherit the kingdom of God. So does sin separate us from God? Yes, it does. Does sin, if we continue in sin and do not repent of it, will it separate us from God eternally? Will we be in hell? Will God pronounce us in hell? Yes, He will, because He's a loving God. And so whoever put that tract out needs to know, and if you're watching tonight, you need to know very clearly that sin does separate you from God and sin will send you to hell. Because when you disobey God in any way whatsoever, that is sin. And you cannot be saved in a sinful state. The blood of Christ was given to wash away our sins, Acts 22 and verse 16, where Peter, Paul was told to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, so we know that sin separates us from God. And sin will lead us to an eternal destiny in hell. So again, needs to be some corrections in that tract, because sin does indeed send us to hell. As God pronounces the judgment one day on all of us, Matthew 7, verse 21, that not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but he that does my will. Well, Hope that answers that question. If anyone knows of that track that's going around and you want to call in and have more questions on that, we'll be glad to take those questions or any question that you might have regarding <clears throat> the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11 says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I understood like a child. I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There's a period of our life that is where it is most notable and certainly all right to be children. But there's nothing more unbecoming than a man who continues to perpetuate nothing but childishness. He is absolutely oblivious to any responsibility he is totally innocent and, and naive of anything in life. He seems to think that life is just a bowl of cherries all the time and that it's a kind of a great big laugh all the way through. It's okay to be like that when you're a child. But as you grow, you learn a lot of things. And you learn about reality. And you learn that you are growing. And with growth comes maturity. And there are some things that might be cute on a child that certainly are not cute on an adult. If I were to sit down at the table and start stuffing food in my mouth with both hands, people would say, that's gross. But yet we look at a child doing it and we say, well, isn't that cute? Okay. Well, we know the difference and you get that difference. So when we become men, we put away childish things. We've been talking about what the Bible does to guide us through the different stages of our lives. And now we're going to be talking about the adulthood. We talked about the teen years, and now we're looking at the adult years. Uh, the adult years are described by Tim LaHaye in Understanding the Male Temperament on page 35 as this, quote, Beneath the folds of every man's complex nature lurks a fun-loving boy. At times the boy in him may dominate, so that in spite of adult responsibilities that stifle these boyish tendencies, Sooner or later, the boy will surface like a cork under the water. Now, anybody that knows me very much knows that I like to enjoy life. I have a little bit of boyishness in me still. And there is a little bit of boyishness and boyish tendencies and an attitude or an, a, a demeanor of joy that we have in childhood that should go along with us all of our days, not immaturity, but a zest for life. 
a hunger for to enjoy the things God has given us to enjoy. Nothing wrong with that. But again, when we let that di di digress into nothing in the world but a continual joke in our life and a continual self-absorption, then we are in problems. And the scriptures teach that. John Dryden said that men are but children, just bigger. Ben Franklin said in Poor Richard's Almanac several years ago, at 20 years old, the will reigns, at 30, the wit, and at 40, judgment comes along. Well, another man said this, at 20, at 20 a man is a peacock, at 30, he's a lion, at 40, he's a camel, at 50, he's a serpent, and at 60, a dog, and 70, an ape. Pretty dire attitude about the stages of our lives. This is what man says about our life. Does that sound like your life? I hope not. And then the man went on to say, when you get to be 80, you're like nothing at all. There's a hopelessness in, that, in those statements, isn't there? That life is just one continual grind, uh, that you go downhill from the time that you're born and there's just no joy at all in it. Compare that with the book of Ecclesiastes where we are told to enjoy the days we have on this earth. To enjoy our life while we live under the sun, but all of it in view of life over the sun. And it is really with that in mind that any aspect or stage of our lives has true meaning. What does it mean to be an adult? Well, several years ago there was people that used to believe in etiquette. Manners were taught in school. There were whole quarters given to the subject of how to be a person in society, how a man treats a woman, how he should tip his hat to her, how she should always make sure when he's walking with her that she is protected from the mud on the street so she walks on the inside, not the outside. And again, uh, he should not walk rapidly in front of a lady. No gentleman should stand on the corner and make any remark about a lady who passes by. All he is to do is to tip his hat in courtesy. He should give his seat to any lady that comes in in his presence. A gentleman should also accommodate uh, his pace to the pace of the lady so that he does not appear to walk in front of her and leave her behind. These are things that some people said as you get to be an adult, you learn these. and. Really, as young men got to be uh, 14, 15 years old, they had to learn these things. Well, and ladies had the same types of things. In Matthew 6 and verse 33, as we become adults, we learn that there are some different priorities that we have. Now, certainly from a young age, we should be taught to follow in the ways of God, and we'll talk about that when we talk about child rearing. But the child rearing years, but in Matthew 6, 33, mature people are told here, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. As we become adults, we have to realize that the most important things in life are not getting an ice cream cone or going to get a popsicle. While still joyous to have those things, that is not what life consists of. That's not what you live for. Life does not consist of how many ball games you've won or how hard you can throw a baseball or a football. There are some more important things than that. And as we mature, even at a young age, we are to begin to realize that life has no true meaning at any stage of our lives without remembering who we belong to and who put us here. Young people should be taught the principles of God and who God is and how much He loves us and how much He cares for us and how He wants us to come live in His house one day and be His servants and be His, His people one day and how we're longing to do that. And so every step that you take in your life, you need to think about it with the idea of what does God think of what I'm doing? Ordering your paths according to to the, word, to the Word of the Lord. Seek the Kingdom 
and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to us. What does it mean to seek the kingdom first for an adult? How do we do that? Well, most of the world focuses on material things, and that's dealt with in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, where it says there you cannot serve God and man. You have to make a choice. Who will you serve? Yourself, the world, the pleasures of the world, or will you serve the Lord and His will? We have to focus on submission to the Lord as our King, and that means that we look to heavenly things rather than just to the earthly sources. We're not looking for the quick fix, just getting through something. We're looking beyond that to what we have waiting for us. And we think, I don't know how you are, but when I was a young man, very, very young, my father would tell me when I was in his house, he'd said, son, you'd stay out of a lot of trouble if you just think before you act. You know, he was right, and he still is. How much trouble could we stay out of if we would think of the consequences of our actions before we act. Just think. Someone says, put your mind in gear before you take emotion. I think that's important. To put our mind in gear and to let us think properly about what God says and whether what we're going to do is pleasing to God. That's an adult behavior. That's the behavior of a mature person. A childish person thinks only of what's going to get him to the next thrill. But an adult thinks about how this will affect him eternally. What kind of man was Jesus Christ? Well, let's look at Luke chapter 2 and we'll see a little bit about who Jesus was. Jesus, as a, as a young child, was a young child who was raised to serve the Lord. Mary and Joseph were his earthly parents, and they did a fine job of training him in the ways of how he should walk and what he should do as a, as a devout Jew. And in the last verse here of Luke chapter 2, we find that Jesus increased in wisdom. He was a knowledgeable individual. He increased in stature. He was physically fit. And he grew. And he also grew in favor with God, that spiritual and with man. So Jesus, a man that we can all look at as an adult and say, okay, what kind of man must I be? How can I follow in the steps of Jesus? I have to first of all be knowledgeable. That requires studying His Word, studying about Him, and certainly learning the things that we need to navigate in this life, but not only that, but learn all of that with the understanding that it only matters if we are people of God. He grew in wisdom. He grew in stature. He was physically a person that took care of himself. And then it also says that he grew in favor with God. That's the spiritual development. He was taught as a Jew, young Jewish boy to develop in the ways of the Lord. He was taught to read. He was taught to comprehend. He was taught to, to understand the law. And indeed at 12 years old, earlier in Luke chapter 2, he was found in the temple teaching the teachers. And they were, they were amazed at some of the questions he was asking. He was a young man who remembered his Creator in his youth. And he remembered that serving God, he was here to do his Father's will. And he told his mama that. Know you not that I must be about my Father's business. And then also it says here that he grew in favor with man. Now that's social development. So a man of God is a man that realizes that he must be a wise person, not only have knowledge, but know how to use it. And also he's somebody that grows in stature. That's kind of the physical development of all of us. We will grow as we get older. And then he grew in favor with God, spiritual development. You take that spiritual development out of the four things that are talked about here, and you've got a real big hole because spiritually you're not, we've got a lot of men that are going around today that call themselves adults, but they're not whole adults because they've not developed themselves spiritually. And if you're watching tonight and you're a man and you've given no attention at all or just very little attention to your spiritual development before God, it's about time you started, don't you think? It's about time you got busy with that because you're not a complete man, a man of God, until you give God the time that He needs and that He demands. 
You need to study the things of God. You need to learn the things of God. Now, this is not something that is commonly presented on the TV screen that you need to read your Bible to be a man. Very seldom do you see anybody reading their Bible and, it, and it's shown that they are a person that is pleasing to God. Now, some of the older movies, you see that. But generally speaking, a man's man is one that drinks a brew and knows how to shoot and knows how to bully people around and whip them if he needs to. That's a man. He can endure all kinds of things. But you don't see anything about, many times, about what it takes to be God's man and be spiritually developed. You know, Jesus Christ was no wimp. He was no wimpy little guy that didn't have any type of behavior that was manly at all. He was man's man. He was God's man. He was trained by a man that was a carpenter, Joseph. And it's also said in the, in the Matthew that he was also a carpenter himself. A carpenter had to be a pretty stout individual. He had to know exactly what he was doing, and he had to be very skilled in his, in his role. For 30 years, that's what Jesus did. And only for three and a half years was he preaching on a regular basis. And then he died on the cross for you and for me. Jesus is our example, men, of what we should be. Jesus was a good man. He was a godly man. He was a moral man. And he was a patient man. Now to all of you who don't believe in God, Jesus was God in the flesh. But he submitted himself to his own creation. Without him, nothing was made that was made. He also, as the example of what a man is, he looked to God. So many people today say there is no God. Well, the Old Testament tells us anybody that says that, the psalmist said he's a fool. There is a God. And Jesus knew that. And he's the example of what a man is. He was godly, he was moral, he was patient. He was a man of tender compassion. He was able to be touched when he looked at the multitudes and saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And he had compassion on them because they were scattered. Jesus was a strong man in every way. You'd just look to the cross to see the physical strength of Jesus, beaten to where most men would die, and he still was alive. Spit on, put on a cross, and he did not make a sound, did not make a sound, until he made those statements at the cross. He is very strong. The kind of man we should aspire to become, men, is the man of Jesus, the man in the flesh that Jesus was came to do His Father's will. Are you all about doing your Father's will, God? If you haven't started that yet, you're not an adult, like you ought to be. Oh, you may be responsible in so many ways, and you may be able to hold down a job and do things, and you could out-drink anybody in the, in the room, but you're not God's man doing those things. You need to be God's man spiritually, too. And if you've not made those preparations and put aside all the foolishness and childishness of the world, then you're not God's man. Now, someone says, well, what about me? I'm a woman. Does Jesus teach me anything about what a woman should be? Well, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, in talking to New Testament Christians, notice what he says here about being unselfish. And we'll just go to that chart right now. Let each of you look out not only for your own business, but also for the interests of others. And let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. There's that servant spirit. A spirit that says, I am here to serve. Jesus could have come in any way he wanted to to this earth. But he came as a humble servant, came to poor parents, not parents that had a lot of money. And notice, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So, 
The biblical guide for all adults, male and female, is to leave selfishness behind and to put yourself on the back burner. Well, Tim LaHaye in his book, Understanding the Male Temperament, describes the adult male this way. Starts out as a baby, he moves on to being a child and notice that the center of everything is self. Then as an adolescent, he still has self crowned in his, as the head. But then as an adult, he's supposed to put that away, but he keeps it there. A man that always has, from the time he's a baby to the time he's an adult, what pleases himself is going to be a failure as a man, folks. What you see here with self as the center is a man that is not a true whole man before God. And that should tell us something. Jesus was not someone that thought of himself first. He always thought of others first. We can come back to me now. Does Jesus, is he first place in your life or are you? Have you crowned yourself the king of your own life or the Lord? Again, if you were an adult who's going around keeping yourself at the center, if you're an adolescent responsible to God and you're keeping yourself as the center, you need to learn some lessons about what it means to humble yourself and let God reign and you turn loose of the reins and let Him be in charge. Also, Jesus avoided any type of moral ambiguity of any kind. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses 8 through 11, Jesus, as a law keeping, a law of Moses keeping young man, notice what it says here. Do not drink wine or an intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. This shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that you may be able to distinguish between what is holy and what is unholy, between what is clean and what's unclean, that you may reach the children of Israel, all teach them all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. Now again, that's addressing the priesthood. We are priests today of God. And we need to know that there are certain things that go, go along with being God's servant. Drinking wine, intoxicating beverages, or drugs is something that should not be in our lives. It's a statute throughout your generation so that we may understand how to distinguish between what's holy and unholy, clean and unclean, and then teach that to our children. You know, you can't teach your children something you won't do, can you? So you need to practice these things in your own life. How many homes right now, and I hope I'm not talking about you tonight, but how many of you have liquor in your household? Have it in the, up on a shelf somewhere or you have it in, in the refrigerator? Now let me just challenge you right now, just go get it and pour it out. Someone says, well, that would be a waste of money. Well, you consider the potential that each one of those liquor bottles has to destroy you, your home, and your children, and your grandchildren, and you just consider that, and you will not think it a big deal at all to pour it down the sink. Also, that's not to mention how many innocent people on highways that you may destroy by taking those little drinks that you take. Alcohol has no business in the life of a Christian, period. And that's an unpopular thing to teach these days, but it is absolutely true. And I know people that will come out and say, well, now, wait a minute, a little of it's good for your stomach. Really? Did you know doctors will tell you that a little bit of cranberry juice or grape juice is just as good for you? And that really you don't need anything alcoholic in your life at all? Doctors, that's the, that's the, general consensus of most medical people today. Someone says, well, I'm not sure about that. Let me ask them, are you really drinking for your health? Most people will use that as an excuse. Did Paul authorize 
some alcohol in something for medicine? Yes, he did. But folks, we're not drinking medicine. People are drinking because they want to drink. And the Bible says, put it away. Get it out. Don't have anything to do with it. The potential, the proverb writer tells us, that is raging. And it causes all types of problems. The proverb writer in Proverbs 28 says, you'll see strange things. Reality will fade. And it destroys homes. If you don't believe that, you go look at people that are divorced. And you will see selfishness in the middle of it. And usually selfishness will present itself with either a drug problem or an alcohol problem or a woman problem. All of them seated, and all of them go together, by the way, by selfishness, moral ambiguity. I'm going to not stand for the Lord totally. I'll just stand for Him sort of. What's the danger? of moral ambiguity. Nadab and Bihu were killed for offering profane fire to God, Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. The Lord established law for the priests and they were to abide by it. The law was that you are to take the fire from a fire that is always kindled and take the embers from there. But they sought to make their own fire and not get it from the right source. When they did so, they could not distinguish and were not distinguishing between what was holy to God and what was unholy, and between what was clean and what was unclean. And so it is with substances today. The failure to understand what gives God glory and exalts Him and what doesn't. In order to be able to teach the Israelites, the, 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 Jew, or the priests had to be able to delineate between what was right and wrong, so they could train the people in the right ways. In Christ, according to 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, all of us are priests. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And we're to remain sober, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, because the devil roams about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we have to be serious minded. We have to have our head on. And from the first drink, the head begins to get fogged need to think clearly. Substances do nothing but cloud your reason. And that which is something that you wouldn't do, all of a sudden you're, you're not immune to it anymore because you're not thinking right. Well, man changes often, one German proverb says, but he never gets better. Again, that's a sad worldly look at adulthood. As we get further and further into the mathematical world as we grow, we learn geometry, we learn physics, we learn chemistry, we learn um, very advanced calculus and things along those lines. And we learn these things and how to be able to work those problems by having a strong foundation from a very young age of basic mathematics. The Word of God has some basic things that we're supposed to learn as children. They help build us into the men that we should be. And you and I have some very basic things. Jesus loves us. This I know a child will sing. For the, what tells us so? The Bible. From a young age you should be getting into your children, into yourself, the idea that Jesus loves you. He loved you enough to die for you. And you know that because the Bible tells us, and you got the Bible from God and from Jesus who sent the Holy Spirit to guide men to write down the things that they want us to know to guide us to heaven. There's a map that leads to heaven, and God's given it to us in the New Testament. You can do these things, and you can go to heaven. You're a sinner when you fall short of God's will, and you must get something done about that. And Christ is the answer to that as you obey Him and what He said, because you love Him. Because you love Him. I want, you to, I want to read you something from an atheist about growing through the stages of life. He says, when we wrestle with real problems of conscience, this is, again, an atheist, 
not easy or obvious ones. We're in the ethical penumbra, where things are not certain. The shadowed, partly lighted area in between the dark side of the moon or the planet and the brightly lit side is where we find ourselves. So many decisions in our lives are just like that. I want to ask you something. Is that how you think? If you believe in God, you don't think that way. There are some very clear-cut things. Decisions are clear-cut. Right, wrong. It's pretty clear. But when you take right and wrong out, that nothing innately is right or wrong, it's just left up, left up to how you feel each day, then you are constantly in a dilemma. What do I do? And if so, why, do I, why did I do that? You put God in the picture, why do you do what you do? Because there's a right, there's a wrong, there's pleasing, there's unpleasing. There's holy, there's unholy. And who decides that? Not you, based upon how you feel, but God a standard. And so we have a standard to live toward. We have reason. We have stability. We have certainty. And we have purpose. On page 135 and 136, Joseph Fletcher, who is the atheist I'm, I'm quoting, he says he calls abortion a brave and responsible decision, an innate, innately right because it saves you from all of the conundrums that you go through in the life of an adult. What's he saying? It's better to die as a child or never come into the world than to have to deal with the problems of life. Well, again, he's wrong because when he was thinking that way, he did not include God in the picture. Later on, he began to think later in different ways. Is everything in this life relative as I'm an adult? Like we're told today, like we're trained from a young child. If you just go by the training you're given today from a worldly standpoint, you're taught that you're an animal and that animal evolved from some piece of slime that somehow made itself up out of a swamp somewhere. By the way, we don't know where all that came from because there's no explanation for it, it just was. And so there are no absolutes in life. Everything is relative. If you're trained that way, then you're trained in a very bad way. You have no basis to make any decision that you make. No standard. It's all up to what the person feels at the moment. Are matters of judgment relevant? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, we are told there that we can all speak the same things and that we be joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Are there matters of conscience? Yes. God delineates those for us when He says there in 1 Corinthians 10, 27-29, for instance, about the eating of meats. He said some people eat meat, some people don't. Neither one matters to Him. That's a matter of your own conscience. What you decide to do with your life, God leaves that up to you. Again, clearly marked what he would leave out as a matter of judgment. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 talks about milk, and it talks about solid food. Milk belongs to babies. Solid food belongs to adults or mature people who by reason of their exercise of the things of God have grown. And Hebrews 5 says and laments the idea that they haven't learned like they need to. Are there weightier matters of the law? Are there some hard things in the law of God? Yes. Can we know them? Yes. Can they be known and can we live them? Yes. Are there things that are hard to understand? Yes, there are. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 16 says exactly that, that there are certain things that are hard to understand. Peter goes on to say, I'm telling you some of these things not because you don't know them, but because you do know them. How do we learn? How do we know things? How do we understand something that before we did not understand? We study, we learn, we put ourselves to the task. We consider it important to know what God wants us to do. Well, does a man that is a real man, as an adult person, have any idea of what would be matters of judgment or conscience or law? Can we decide? Yes. Based upon what? based upon the Scripture. 
where the mind of God is revealed to us. Well, in Mark chapter 10, 12 and verse 30, one of these basic symptoms, ba basic uh, fundamental tenets for all of us to live, live by is this. Jesus, a man came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? And he was told, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Friends, when you do that, you're being an adult. When you're a child, you don't understand what all is. When you're an adult, you do. Everything, 100%, all in. You love God that much, and you will do whatever He says, however He says it, without an argument. But you must love the Lord your God with all of your soul, your mind, and your strength. In, in athletics, the coach says, give 110%. That's what you're giving God. You don't hold back. You don't give Him the, the bare necessities. You give Him all of yourself. And really, in essence, that's what the Lord wants from everybody. And that's what being an adult Christian really means. Well, another principle for us that deals with us where we live, an adult has to have some idea of what to do with money, doesn't he? You know how many problems that a child has from just being a spendthrift? Well, when, when I was young and my parents gave me an allowance, I got, I think, 15 cents a week. Well, I could spend that 15 cents on anything I wanted, but I had to remember this, that five cents of it went to God. That was, so that left me with 10. Well, 10 cents would buy a whole lot more than it does now. But I had a tendency when I was younger, and it followed me into my adulthood, that if I had 10 cents, I would spend 10 cents. And then if my brother had 10 cents, and he, at the end of the week, still had five, I'd try to borrow two of his, you know. He was pretty cheap, he wouldn't let me do that. So I had to do without. Well, I found out very quickly that when you spend it all quickly, you don't have anything. And if you spend it too much, you know, there's nothing wrong with saving some of it too. What should have, what I should have done, given the Lord five, saved five, spent five. I try to do that more now, but that's something that a lot of people have a hard time doing, even adults. Do you know that in our society that most every family in the United States lives one paycheck away from bankruptcy? If they just miss one check. Have you ever gone by houses and wondered how somebody has a boat, a large SUV, a truck, and a car, and a huge house? And then they've got their kids in every sport in town. Mama's working, daddy's working, the kids, well, they get picked up by this one and that one. They go to daycare, they do this, and everybody's busy, but you don't have much of a home. What are they doing? They're having stuff. They haven't learned to handle money. One of the basic things of being a good steward that Jesus taught in the Scriptures. All of our blessings come from God. They're all on loan to us. We don't really own anything. We're just borrowing it for the time we're here and will not take any of it with us. So we need to learn to number our possessions and to realize that possessions are not everything that man, that man cracks it up to be. Matthew 6, 24, again, no man can serve two masters. He'll hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Is it wrong to have things? God never said it was. But when you let those things own you and control every movement that you make, every one of them's wrong. When you've crowned it as your God. In 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, those that desire to be rich will fall into a temptation and a snare and into many hurtful lusts that drown men in, de in destruction and in perdition. And here it is. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Notice what it says, the love of money. It doesn't say money is the root of all kind of evil. It says that the love of money. 
Abraham was a wealthy man. Job was too. Joseph certainly was wealthy. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were very wealthy. Lot was wealthy. Solomon was the wealthiest man that ever lived. But notice it is not money that's the problem. It's the love of it. And you want that more than anything in the world. And again, you know what type of shape homes are in when adults are chasing money and leaving God out. You know, if you serve the Lord like you should, all the things come, Matthew 6, 24. Some, having gone after, have strayed from the faith. Look at this word, in their greediness, and they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Friends, adults learn how to handle money and not let money handle them. Do you know how to do that? Someone says, I, I don't know what to do. I'm in a mess and I don't know how to get out of it. Well, the Bible gives you some principles. Don't be in love with money. Somebody says, well, I've got to be in love with money or I won't have any. Well, what does Matthew 6, 24 say? What does Matthew 6, 33 say? Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added. That's a promise from God. Will you always have enough to eat and a, and a warmth, a place to sleep if you serve the Lord? Yes. You'll have the needs, the necessities of life. Will you always have as good as your neighbor? No, because your neighbor may not need those things either. You'll have what God wants you to have, what He allows you to have, and what He knows will not distract you from serving Him. God blesses those that serve Him. But that blessing may not be wealth in a monetary sense. I was raised by a father who didn't have a lot of money. But I tell you what, I'm a wealthy man and I was a wealthy child because we had gospel preachers in our home all the time. I got to sit down and just listen to them talk about the Bible. I'm wealthy. I had grandparents, an extended family that could tell the Bible stories so well. And I tell you what, you can't put a money price on that, folks. That's wealthy. What are you giving your kids? Do you even read the Bible to them and read the Bible with them? Do you have family Bible studies? Adults lead their children. Adults lead their babies into learning the Scripture. And they go to church services with their children. They don't send them they go with them. Adults do that. Adult babies go fishing on Sunday and Wednesday and serve themselves on those times and train their children to do the same thing. And as a result, you have a bunch of children, a bunch of people and the next generation that is headed to hell and taking the next one with them. Have you done your child a service? by spending time with them that is not of a quality nature, spiritually speaking? Yes, spend time with your children in any number of things, but especially spend time with them, praising and serving your God in worship. Well, adults also cultivate a character. They develop integrity, and that is the ability to do right no matter whether anybody is watching or not. You do right because it's God wants you to. Adults do that. You do it without really regarding how much you're going to get out of it. You do it because you want to serve the Lord. In First Peter, pardon me, in First Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, Peter says this. He says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. He tells us there that we're just camping out here. We're on one big long camping trip, folks. And adults know that. We're not planning to stay here. We're camping out. He says, in view of that, he goes on to say, abstain from fleshly lusts because they war against your soul. You don't go pick a fight with the enemy all the time. You try to avoid the conflict, don't you? And so you abstain from fleshly lusts that war against your souls. And that may not be fornication and adultery. It may be greed. He says, have your conduct honorable, that when they speak against you as evildoers and call you something evil, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. 
If somebody called you a cheat and a liar, can you keep them from doing that? No. But what you can do is live in a way as to where nobody would find that believable because your fruits show just the opposite. You still can't st keep anybody from talking about you. But you can make sure your life is put together in such a way as to where it won't be believable. What they say about Jesus? They said Jesus was a fraud. He was a pretender. He was a blasphemer. He was a liar. He was the devil himself. Do you believe that about Jesus? We know the story, don't we? And we know that none of those were right accusations, although made with, by people with credentials. Kings, others. At the last, though, it's interesting that the ones who were most powerful had changed their view of Jesus. They said, we cannot have anything to do with the blood of this innocent man. He's done nothing wrong. And so the evidence pointed just the opposite. And even one of the kings was surprised when Jesus would not answer. And he says, don't you hear what they're saying about you? And Jesus just looked at him. Did not believe. You don't have to defend yourself when the things they're saying is not, not true. Well, behave honorably in the world. You know what honor is? Is there an honorable man that lives today? I hope so. I know a few. And I hope that I am going to be an honorable man in what I do in my life. But is there an honor? What does it mean to be an honorable man? That means a man that does what he says, that keeps his commitment, and primarily that he keeps his commitment to God. If you're scheduled to work, work. Don't show up late. If you say you'll do something, follow through with it. I had a grandfather that was known during the Depression times to walk two or three miles to pay a man a nickel because he shook hands on it. His word was his bond. And he told him he would pay him a nickel within two weeks, and he did within two weeks, and it was always early. It was hard money then. Nickel was a lot of money back then. Well, do we have people that will keep their word today? When I was in college, I'd always have guys come by and say, will you loan me a quarter for a Coke? And I just finally said, no, I'll give you a quarter. <laughs> Don't ask me to loan it to you because I know you're not going to come pay me back. I'll just buy you a Coke. How about that? Well, do people intend to be that way? No. But the fact is, if you tell somebody you'll pay them back, then pay them back. Keep your word, and particularly keep your word to God. Do you know if you're a Christian tonight, like the Bible says, you told God that you would serve Him and put Him first. You better be keeping that commitment. If you're a husband tonight, you told your wife, I will be faithful to you all the days of my life. You better be doing that. I will love you with all of my heart. I'll be there for you in sickness and in health. Well, you better be there. I'll look out after you and kids if they come along. I'll do that. You better be doing that or you're not the adult that you think you are. You're just an adult like the world looks at it, going from point to point with no particular end in mind. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37, on this subject of integrity and keeping your word, the Lord addresses it this way. He says, let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. You don't have to follow it up with some swearing. He just says, let people know. When you tell somebody yes, you mean yes. When you tell them no, you mean no. In Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 8, Apostle Paul says here, bond servants must be obedient to those who are their masters. With fear and trembling and sincerity as to Christ, not with eye service, not with the attitude of pleasing men, but as a bond servant of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Colossians 3.23 says it this way, A true man of God does what he does as if he's doing it for the Lord and not unto men. Whatever you do, he says there, Colossians 3.23, do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. You know that man of God, that is a true godly adult, a real adult, 
is an individual that serves God and works everything, does everything he does. Not because he's doing it because people are watching and he wants to impress them, but because he wants to be what God wants him to be. And so he works, he works hard. He's the hardest worker. He has agreed to work on a job. He's going to be the best employee any man ever had because he's not working for that man. He's working for the Lord. He's going to be the best citizen he can be because he is working for the Lord. He's going to be the best husband that he can be. All of this, folks, is a part of being an adult as the Bible dictates it. In Ephesians 6, 5 through 8, he ends this passage with saying, do these things with good will as if you're doing service to God, knowing that whatever good anyone does, watch this, what's your reward? He will receive the same from the Lord, whether he's a slave or whether he's a free man. So again, whatever good anyone does, will God forget it? No. Does that mean he's working his way to heaven? No. Does that mean he's trying to impress God so much that God says, boy, I owe you? No. He's just serving the Lord. And God says, if you serve me, I'll reward you. But don't serve me because I'll reward you. You serve me because you love me. Well, we're going to go to a different subject now, and that is when we're adults, one of the decisions we make is about whether to be a parent or, or, or whether to be married or not. And the Bible is very clear on the subject of marriage. I mean, there's, there's not a lot that we need to know about marriage. The Lord doesn't tell us. The Lord furnishes us with all things we need. You know, you find a lot of people today that said, I don't, I'm married, but I don't know what to do. Well, okay, there's a guide for that. Now, to the person without God, it's just left up to you and your wife as to whatever you want to do. If you are a person that's watching tonight and you're living together, as soon as the program's over, you all need to depart from one another and go to your own house. You don't have a right to live together. The world might tell you you do, but God says you don't. You don't have a right to one another sexually until you're married. So if you're committing fornication, stop it and ask one another to forgive you for that. And then you get away from one another. And if you continue to date one another, you make sure it's a pure relationship. Sexual relationship is only pure within the marriage bounds, within the bounds of marriage. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, the proverb writer says, He that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. You don't have to be married to go to heaven, but if you choose to be married to a wife, then you treat her right. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, and if you have your Bible, or if you don't have your Bible, we'll put it up here for you. Genesis 2 and verse 18, the Lord said, it is good that man should not, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Did you know that up to this point in the book of Genesis, everything God made, he said it is good? And the first time he said something wasn't good was when he said that it is not good that man should be alone. I will make her, him a helper fit or comparable to him. Loneliness is the first thing that God's eye named not good. And you think about that, in Genesis 2.24, God made man a woman and brought her to him, made him out of his rib. So therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now God at that time had the first wedding ceremony in the Garden of Eden. He was the officiant. Adam and Eve were the bride and the groom. And the witnesses were the Holy Spirit and the Son of God. Well, God instituted the home long before He instituted anything else. The home is the oldest institution out there. And notice it is a man and a woman. Okay? Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed is undefiled. Hebrews 13, verse 4. Now, friends, I'm going to broach a subject that is not popular, 
in this in our society today and we even have a candidate running for president that is involving himself with something that he calls his wife but it's a man in the beginning God saw that it was not good for man to be alone so he did not make another man for man he made a woman for him in a marital relationship and he said this is now bone of your of my bone flesh of my flesh adam says and so he called her woman because she came from him in every aspect a woman is different than a man a woman is like a man in many ways but she is his complement in other words the things that are lacking in him she takes up and that is the way a husband and wife relationship is to be the man and the woman the woman subject to the man the man loving the woman as he should that's how god wants it now i hear a lot of people that are i go to the gym i go to different places and I'm, when I'm out in the public and I hear a lot of people over overhear them don't try to eavesdrop but you just hear them sometimes sometimes they're very angry about their spouse and I want to just go tell them because they're talking about their spouse to other people and I have to fight the urge to say something to them and say have you ever talked to your spouse about what you're saying right now you seem to be able to talk but why would you tell someone that you're a friend with or a co co-worker with what you will not tell your spouse one of the biggest problems with the marriage relationship being what it should be is that the people don't talk to one another they don't say the things that are necessary to try to resolve an issue sometimes when they do talk to one another it is always in a vindictive state or a, a challenging state and we have to be careful to preserve our homes like they should be. Well, you and I need to know that marriage is a high honor. Marriage is is uh, something that all of us should look forward to. I want to read you what the Catholic Church said about marriage. Jerome said this on page 643, and he was a priest in Rome. Marriage is always a vice. All that could be done is to excuse it and sanctify it. Therefore, we have made it a religious sacrament. What's his attitude about marriage? It's a vice. God said it was good. And marriage is a good thing. Now, Paul goes on to say that in certain situations, it's better not to be married. But Paul was not saying that you never should marry, because he talks about in Ephesians 5 about the marriage relationship and how pretty it is. Are there challenges? attend in marriage oh yeah there are when you put two people together there are going to be some challenges there's going to be troubles in the flesh first corinthians 7 28 those that marry will have trouble in the flesh talking in the context of the present distress he who is married cares about the things of the world how he may please his wife that's a that's not spoken of as something that's difficult in this context is talking about something that might be a challenge to a person when you're under particular persecution a person by themselves just has to worry about themselves but he says that if you're married you have another person to be concerned about and he doesn't say it's wrong it's just something that's factual you're not just thinking for yourself you're thinking for your spouse and that is as it should be it's one of the challenges we have when we're married you want to please them not just yourself and first corinthians chapter 7 34 it says she who is married cares about the things of the world how she may please her husband and notice in verse 33 the man thinks about the same so there's a mutual caring for one another isn't there you're concerned about each other and that's part of our love for one another someone says well how does that happen well in 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17, we know that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life are things that adults, mature people, will deal with. So when we're in a marriage relationship, we're not just thinking about one another or about ourselves, we're thinking about one another. How do I help my spouse stay away from sin? 
not know how do I get them into sin. That shouldn't be the way we look at life. But people should be trying to help one another go to heaven. Now, if you're watching tonight, I ask you a question. If you're a couple, or maybe you're a man sitting there, maybe you and your wife are having trouble, maybe you and your husband are having trouble. Have you tried trying to please the Lord? Why don't you try to be pleasing to God and see if that doesn't make you more attractive to your spouse? Put others first. Put them first. Quit thinking about you all the time. Every marriage that ever has trouble, at the, whole, at the core of it is yourself. Somebody, or both, have grown selfish and decided to serve themselves rather than one another. Again, one of the leading causes for divorce in this world is immaturity in marriage, selfishness in marriage, financial issues in marriage, sexual sins in marriage. Those are the main issues that destroy marriages. In the ancient world, there was something to be said in the ancient world, there still is, that a man should prove himself a man and a responsible, mature man before he marries. That he should have already established a vineyard. He should already have established a house. That he has something to bring into the marriage and something of substance to bring in, to offer someone. You look at today, and we have people today that are, don't, they, they don't know anything about marriage. All they know is they, they have lust for one another and passion for one another. And they think that, well, okay, let's get married. But they really don't care for one another. There's some very foolish things that sometimes young people do when they get married. You have two immature people that get married. To, they're not adults, but they're immature. They're technically 21 or 18 or whatever they have to be. But boy, they are a whole lot less than that. They go spend their money on drugs, on liquor, on partying, on toys, on guns, on, on a new truck, on this, that, or the other. And they have no idea. They just, I want, I want, I want. And not, I'm willing to give, I'm willing to sacrifice, I'm willing to serve. Well, financial issues get to be a problem in a marriage. Personality issues are a problem. Sexual issues are a problem in marriage. All of these are troubles in the flesh. Can we remedy those things? Yes. One of the reasons for marriage is to avoid fornication. Each one serving the other one in that relationship. Working together to help one another fulfill the things that are necessary in the physical needs of the flesh and being very patient and understanding in those things. Not demanding your way all the time. Changing impressions. And again, if you want to give in the marriage, if that's the way you look at it and not take all the time, then you'll be that type of individual that will work out all these problems. In Genesis 29 verse 25, with Jacob and Leah, it came to pass in the morning that it was Leah. And she said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? This is what uh, Jacob said. Was, did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Well, Laban wanted to marry off Leah first. And then uh, Jacob could have had Rachel. Jacob loved Rachel. But again, there was, a, there was a problem there. There was deceit involved with the father-in-law. And so you had problems of animosity from the very beginning. In Job 2 in verse 9, Notice one of the things that has to be done in marriage is maintaining integrity. Now, Job's wife here leads him in a way she shouldn't, uh, gives him advice she shouldn't give him. Her advice, the closest person to him at that point on this earth, everybody else was gone, was his wife. And her advice was curse God and die. Now, can we influence one another in our marriages? Yes. Do we? Yes. We either influence for good or we influence for bad. Now, the way to have something is to, is to give it away. If you want love, don't look at it and don't look for it. Just give it. And that's an important aspect. That's certainly biblical principle. We need to support one another and lift one another up. 
There are times when one will not feel good. When a person may be going through challenges at work, disturbances, maybe children problems, maybe issues of just depression or whatever it might be. The closest person in the world someone should have is their spouse. And spouses should do all they can to help people, help their spouse through issues of life. When somebody is tempted to do wrong, make sure you're not the source of the temptation. In 1 Kings 11 and verse 8, verse 4, notice what is said about Solomon. When Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart to other gods, and his heart was not loyal to God as the heart of his father David was. So a loyal heart to God. Solomon and David both were polygamists. They had no right to be that way. It wasn't pleasing to God. But we know that it is said there that a spouse can turn your heart away from God or can help turn you toward God. Well, do you and I have an attitude of, with our spouse of helping them be turned to God? You can't do that unless you're the example. And husbands, let me tell you this, you are to lead your wife in the ways of righteousness. It is not to be left up to the wife to do all the cleaning, all the cooking, all the everything in the house, raise the kids, take them to church, and you go out and hunt. You go out and serve yourself and buy yourself this new thing and that new thing. Now that'll destroy your marriage if it hadn't already done it. You need to be partners together, working together. And you need to tell one another that you love one another often and not just say it, but show it. Do you do that? You see, love that's not shown, and I love you that is not shown by actions, is only, only words. We've just come through a time when uh, we're told in this, in this country that there, it's, it's the, one of the major card seasons other than Mother's Day of all times of the year. Everybody wants to be my Valentine. Yeah. Well, it's okay to tell people you love them if you do, but just to say them, it's just a card with words on it, isn't it? Ever look at the cards you give people? Do you mean it? Or are you just being polite? Okay. Well, you see, sometimes if spouse can get the feeling all you're doing is telling me the words I'm, you want me, you think I want to hear, I want to, sh I want you to show it. And so many times we've all we all heard it with preachers. I'd rather see a lesson than hear one any day. Well, the same thing's true in the home and with the spouse. How much should a man love his wife? You ever think about that? Well, how much should I love her? Well, according to the Bible, the Bible addresses that. Ephesians 5, 28 and 29. Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. And here it is up on the chart. Love your wife as your own body, because she is part of you. He that loves his wife loves himself. Wow. If I don't love my wife, and I've had men tell me that, I don't love my wife anymore. I say, well, well, boy, you must hate yourself. And they look at you, and then I read them the passage. Because your love for your wife is commensurate with your love for yourself. And maybe the reason you don't love her is because you don't love you very much. No one never hates his own flesh, it says there. But what does he do to his flesh? He nourishes it, and he cherishes it. We guard our lives, don't we? We don't want to lose our lives. We'll gasp for every breath we can. That's natural. And so we ought to be the same way with our spouse, to nurture and cherish our wives, just like the Lord does His church. He cares about His church. He gave Himself for it. How much is a husband to love his wife? Ephesians 5.23, he's supposed to love her enough to be the head of her, to where she's not having to balance everything altogether. She's not supposed to have to run everything. He's, in, he's the one that takes the full load and does so readily and, and very well. And she, in appreciation for that, does not take advantage of that, but wants to give more and do more. So she reaches out, and each one is giving. Look at this. The husband's the head of the wife, not the dictator. 
and he is the head of the wife. She is subject to him. She wants to serve. He wants to lead. And he will not put on that on her the things that would burden her over much. Well, it's not a position of mastery to be a husband. It's not a position of domineering, or but it is a responsibility of service and, and doing what God has, want, has wanted you to do as a man, an adult man. Jesus came and he did not come, like we've said, to boss people around, to browbeat them, and to hurt them. He came to serve them. He came in the form of a servant. And you need to be the same way. The greatest you'll ever be is a servant. And that's quite an honor right there. It begins with a proper attitude. As Christ loved the church, Ephesians 5.23, we're told to love our wives as our own bodies. All right? When there is marriage without love, there will be love without marriage. Ben Franklin said that several years ago, and I guess he'd know something about that. We have to recognize that we need to recognize that our spouses deserve our love. Nobody made you get married. Ask yourself a question if you're a woman or a man tonight. How would you like to be married to you? You got that? Suppose you were your spouse and they were you. How would you like that? Could you live with you? Do you have corrections to make? Should you be giving more of yourself to your spouse? Should you be giving more of yourself to your husband, your wife, your children? Should you be giving more of yourself to the Lord? Can you do that? Yes. Will you do that? Now there's the question, isn't it? You see, we can all know the right things and what we need to do to fix something, but just put it off and put it off. And there's a whole lot of people in this world, and it, I, it's sad to say, I know a particular couple I'm thinking about now, that economically they have improved themselves better than they've ever had it. But you know what it's cost them? It's cost them relationship with God a relationship with their child, a relationship with one another, that while good at this point could be so much better if they would come back and put the Lord where it needs to be, where he needs to be. And they're not the only couple. There are so many just like that. At once they served the Lord in their marriage and everything was good. They didn't have as much of this world's goods, but they were happy and they were spiritually minded and they love the Lord their God a whole lot more than they do now. Now, do you and I, when you put two people together in a home, will there ever be a disagreement? Yes. But when you disagree, here's some rules for you. There's a book out by Chuck Swindoll called Strike the Original Match, and it gives some advice on how to have a good fight. One of the things it says there, Keep it honest, keep it under control, keep it timed right, keep it positive, keep it tactful, keep it private, keep it cleaned up, keep it, keep it in mind, and also keep it low. Yelling at one another only accentuates the problem. And that's sometimes the only time two people talk to one another in some marriages is when they're yelling at one another. Then somebody gets mad, storms off, and then they sleep again apart for a week or so and won't get over it. That's sad. My mom and dad told us when we got married 44 years ago, they said, don't ever go to bed mad. Always resolve the issue. Sufficient for the day is the trouble of it. Let each day have its trouble and be ended up with it by the time the day's over. That's good advice. That's biblical advice. Straighten out your issues. Grow up. Be an adult and recognize that if you have children and you're in conflict, those kids aren't feeling very secure. So you keep your arguments private. And you let them know that we love one another. And while we may disagree, we love one another. And we're working out the things because God tells us to do that. Pray with one another. And when you are in an argument, Maybe the best thing to do is just pause and say, let's pray. 
and pray about your issues. Now in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 24, the wife is to submit to her husband as she does to Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you would do it to the Lord. For the husband's the head of the wife, and Christ the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body, so the church is subject to Christ, so let the wife be to, his, to her husband in all things. Again, all things that are right and good. Well, keys to a happy marriage? Grow up. Be an adult. Submit. As wives, submit to the husband. Husbands, serve the wife. Love her with all of your heart, soul, and mind. Love as you should. Love as the Bible tells you to do. Talk to one another. Don't talk at one another. Talk with one another. Pray. And put Christ at the center of your marriage. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, All of you be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility. For God resists pride, but He gives grace to those who are humble. James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Chase the devil out of your house, because he wants to destroy your marriage. As an adult married, act like a married adult, and know the dangers. Protect your house. We live in an area where people are very uh, on fire to, to involve themselves in protecting their well, the well-being physically of their home against outward intruders. Well, the biggest outward intruder that's there, that exists, is Satan. And would you let Satan come into your house and destroy or murder your children or your wife? No. You'd do something about it, wouldn't you? Well, if Satan's busy in your house, run him out. You resist him, he'll flee. But if you invite him in, he'll come. And he'll own your house. He'll take it right from you and destroy your family and your relationship. So get mad at Satan. Don't get mad at God. Get mad at Satan. Don't get mad at one another. Just chase the devil out of your home. In James 5, 17, confess your trespasses to one another. You know, it's okay to tell one another that you were wrong. Hard words to say. Easy words. I was wrong. I am sorry. Just three word phrases. Simple to say, but awful hard to mean, aren't they? How come we can't cough those up sometime? Notice, confess your trespasses to one another, pray for one another, so that you'll be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5, the Lord gives the solution to sexual activity in the home and sexual issues when He says this, Let's let the husband render to his wife the affection that is due to her. And also let the wife render that also back to the husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And so likewise, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do you know when you get married, you give up your body to your, to your spouse? And that's a beautiful union. That's a wonderful thing. And they're not, it's not just your body, it's your spouse's too. And so before marriage, your body belongs to you and God. After marriage, it belongs to you, God, and to your spouse. And don't deprive one another of the things that are due. Again, these things are worked out between two people that are adults talking about the needs that they have and the desires that they have that are godly to have. Now, don't expect of your spouse to be something that God does not want them to be. But you enjoy the beautiful sexual relationship within the boundaries of marriage. And God will be happy, and you will be too. In 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5, he goes on to say, Do not deprive one another, except with consent for, some, for a while, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, with the idea of coming back together again. Watch this. So Satan doesn't tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Okay? So again, we have no right to deprive one another and use our bodies as a bargaining tool for our spouse to get our way and to hold ourselves back from one another. Marriage is supposed to be honorable in all things. There may come some times 
where with consent, each one may say, we need some time to ourselves. Sometimes this happens because of illness or because of challenges of, of natural way. But the problem is, that let's just understand that those things will happen and agree that for a while we will be, be alone. In Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 16, notice here the idea of sharing yourself with the world and, not to, and, and forgetting about your relationship to one another. He says in, in a very plain way in Proverbs 5, 16, should your fountain be dispersed abroad? Should it become like streams of water in the street? No, your body is not to be given to the world, but to your spouse. In Job 31, 1, Job here says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I then look upon a young maiden? He's made a covenant with his eyes. Now I'll tell you what, there's a lot of temptation out there, ladies, for your husband as he goes to work. There's a very volatile group of sordid women, evil women, that would destroy your home and take your husband from you. Know that. And so you keep yourself for your spouse. And you let them know that you love them. Don't let them go out of the house with you angry with them. And same thing with you as a husband towards your, towards your wife. There's men that would have her and would take her from you. You know that and you protect yourself from those things. And you be the husband you need to be. Nothing wrong with bringing some flowers home every now and then. Nothing wrong with bringing some chocolate home every now and then, not just on Valentine's Day. But just do nice things. Go out to eat. Take a walk together. Walk the dog, do whatever. These are things we need to do. Pardon me. This idea of not depriving yourself in and, and, um, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 1, in view of the present distress, Paul says again that it, in the idea of a man being by himself, he said it's good for a man not to touch a woman in view of the present distress. But nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each wife have her own husband. There's no other way that God has provided for a man to satisfy his sexual nature than within the bounds of marriage with one man and with one woman. Well, what does the Bible say about children if children come into the world? Brother Irvin Lee several years ago said this, every man has within him a God-given instinct that's holy and right in its proper use. The same is true of the woman. The instinct that causes a man to be attracted to a woman and a woman to a man helps to make marriages strong. It helps to keep one together. Let neither deprive one another of these things. Well, what about honoring your wife like you should? Well, you see, when you honor your wife, you love your wife, you serve your wife as you should, then you begin to develop what we would call a home life a life that is beautiful, a blessed life, a life where there is edifying and sharing, where there is something that is wonderful, where there is a, a great respect for one another and not a resentment of one another. Resentment is awful. On divorce, whenever you argue and whenever you fuss or you have difficulties, you recognize that older people can help guide you, older wise people, you know. My wife, I mentioned that we've been married 44 years on Thursday, and our life has been wonderful in so many ways, but I'll tell you, it hadn't been without challenges. She's challenged much more than I am, but notice that in every situation that we've come into, our first line of defense when we disagree has never been, I'm going to divorce you, or I'll just leave you. It's the idea of how can we work this out? What can we do? And can, there is a resolution. Let's work it out God's way. And that's one of the things that sustained 44 years of marriage. We have a couple at church that's been married 63 years, and they say they're still working hard. I tell people that marriage is work, and you don't just give up. You don't just bail out because work gets hard. It challenges you more to step up. And so it is in marriage. Will challenges come? Yes. Satan is involved in every marriage. He is trying his best to destroy every home that he can. 
And so we need to work at marriage. Why? Because in Malachi 2 and verse 14, the Lord says there that marriage is a covenant made with him, made with him and that he hates putting away. Now, when you vow a vow, you keep it. Now, the only reason for divorce that God gives, that's a scriptural divorce. The only reason for that is in Matthew 19, 9 and Matthew 5, 32. And that is that the put away mate has a right or has no right because they've been put away for fornication and they forfeit the right to remarry. They cannot remarry. The guilty party can never remarry and be right with God when they have cheated on their spouse. One who has put away for any reason, including fornication, that remarries is in adultery. So don't try to destroy your marriage. By the way, do you know that in the state of North Carolina they give you, you have to live apart for a year before you can divorce? I think that's a good idea. Gives you some time to cool off and think about what you're getting ready to do. If you think you'll get rid of your spouse by divorcing him and you have children, oh my, that's not, that's not true. You are going to see them more and have to make arrangements and be cooperative and grow up and be an adult. And I'll tell you this, divorce costs money. I tell all couples, have you put the energy into making your marriage whole that you're getting ready to put in to destroy it? Divorce takes a while. It can get ugly. And the decisions to be made about child custody can make it even uglier. It's a horrible thing. God hates it, and we should hate it. So work out your troubles, folks. And if we can help you in any way along those lines, biblically, you call us, you let us know. Because homes are important, because as the home goes, so goes the world, and so goes the church. So if you need help putting your marriage where it needs to be, give us a call. The number is down there on the right-hand side of the screen, on the bottom. And if you want to resolve the issues that you need to resolve, you let us know. In Psalm chapter 14 and verse 2, after you get married, you learn to be around one another and to get along. After a while, the thought of children will come along. These discussions should have been had long before marriage was consummated about the number of children. Does a person want children or not? These are decisions that adults make. And as we look at the decision to marry, that's an adult decision. And you don't have the right to back out of that. You've committed to one another. And so when that relationship moves on, children may come into the marriage in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 2, it says there, The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there's anyone who understands and who will seek God. The way that people are perpetuated to be servants of God is through homes that are built as godly homes, adults who act as adults should. Well, in Proverbs 22 and verse 6, the first thing that you think of when a baby is announced is first of all, you're on, you're on a high. I'm gonna have a child. This is great, we're gonna have a baby. But notice what happens. What can happen is reality sits in. I don't have any experience in this. I don't know how to be a dad. I don't know how to be a mom. What am I going to do? Well, talk to older people that are wise and know a little bit about these things. Don't try to go find out your best advice from, no, from people that are your best buddy, from your people that are your peers, because they don't know any more about it than you do. Even though they may have had a baby, the older people know about the whole ball of wax, raising kids and all of that. So the Bible says old, younger women are to be taught by the older women. So go talk to an older lady about children. Talk to an older man, men, about 
How am I going to be the type of dad I want to be? Well, Proverbs 22 and verse 6 is what a wise man will lead you to. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. That's very important. And when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Train them up in the way they should go. Bend that twig like it needs to be bent in the way it should go. When it's old, it'll show it. In Isaiah 7, verse 15 through 16, talking of those that are children, curds and honey he will eat that he may not know to refuse evil and choose good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. Again, prophetically talking here. Well, are you able to control yourself as a person? Can you expect responsible behavior from your children if you're irresponsible? Can you train your children in ways that you will not walk in yourself? <coughs> Remember, train up a child in the way he should go. In order to be best able to do that, we need to let God train us in the way we should go, shouldn't we? Our Heavenly Father. So then we'll be able to train up our children in the way they should go because we've had an example of a father that does that. Jesus brought up, he said, if a father, a man that loves his child, if his son asks him for meat, will he give him a rock? No. He give him the things necessary to help him to grow into the man he should be. Respectful and responsible children result from families where the proper amount of love and discipline is present, just like with God toward us. You know, so love and discipline. When you plant a tree, do you discipline that tree? You certainly do. If you're, if you're doing it right, you may tie ropes to it. For what purpose? To make sure it grows straight. Is that restrictive? Yes, it is. Is it mean? No, it's not. Because the tree can be nurtured best when it grows straight. So it is with a child. You nurture that child. You water it. You make sure that it's growing in the right way. And that requires some discipline. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. Sophocles said this, children are anchors that hold a mother to meaning for her life. That's a pretty good statement. Sophocles didn't say a lot of neat things, but that's one of the ones he did. In Ephesians 6, 4, in bringing a child into the world, did you know that when you bring a child into this world that God binds you by an agreement? Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. That's an edict from God. But you train them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You have that responsibility to spiritually guide them to heaven. The book of Proverbs emphasizes the training and the discipline of God. And the Hebrew word for, tra for instruction is musar. And it's that way in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 2. And again, listen to the words. It's like a father training his son, words that they are taught, things that are learned by observation, by experience, and by discipline. Well, you think about the discipline that's necessary. A child does not just have to have corporal discipline to be what he should be. He has to be disciplined both positively and negatively. And in other words, trained in a direction. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, these words I command you today, talking to Israelite, that you shall be, these things shall be in your heart. Teach them diligently to your children, and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Notice, I command you these things, and you bind them in your heart, and then you teach them to your children. You getting ready to be a parent? You're watching tonight, you know somebody that is, tell them to get their heart right with God, to be what they need to be before God so they can be the father, the spouse, the head of the house, like God wants them to be. And so they can train up their children in the way they should go. 
You know, when you train your children right, when you bring them up the right way, then you're bringing them up like God wants you to. Did you know that there, are, that I have written down here from the book of Proverbs uh, and Deuteronomy, and let's see, there's 14, 15 verses that are just out of there about how to train up a good child. I don't know how, how you are, but I've heard people say when children come, we don't have a direction book. Yes, we do. We've got the Word of God. How to direct our children. How to talk to them in the right way, to build them up positively. And also, how to teach them the wrong way and what it costs. There needs to be a penalty when someone does that which is wrong. And we need to know that as we grow older too. God loves us. And Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 that whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. And if He didn't discipline us like He should, then we would be nothing in the world but illegitimate children. And the same thing that we should be toward our children. We love them. We care about them. They are not illegitimate children. They are our children. And we should discipline them as the Bible teaches. The Bible does teach spanking, but it does not teach child abuse. And there needs to be understood a difference in that. Nowhere in the Bible does God authorize an adult to abuse a child in any way whatsoever. But He does authorize the disciplining of the child in a way to restrain them and to realize the error of their way through discipline. And sometimes it hurts. If you knew your child was going to put their hand in a fire and they were headed to do that, would you jerk their hand out of the fire? Yeah, might you hurt them in the process? You might. Did you intend to? Nope. But you're trying to do what? Trying to save them, not trying to hurt them. There's a great deal of difference in proper biblical discipline of children and the discipline that a person has that's abuse where the person's getting a kick out of hurting the child. Something wrong with a person like that. Something horribly wrong with a person imbalanced and nuts to ever want to purposely abuse a child in any way. Now, I had a father that, that spanked me and a mother that did the same, but never did I get the indication that they hated me or that they were trying to hurt me. The Bible says these things are necessary. There are children that demand some, some of that, some that demand more of that. But the bottom line is it should always be given out of love and not hate and not anger that the person has cost you something or made you mad. No, it should be because something has been done that is bad for the child. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 11 through 13, sad situation here with Eli and his boys. The Lord said to Samuel, I will do something in Israel that both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told them that I will judge his house forever for his iniquity, which he knows, because his sons made themselves wicked and he refused to restrain them. Although Eli was a good man in so many ways, he, would, he was responsible for the direction his kids went in, not because he was bearing the iniquity of his children, but because he refused to restrain his children when he should have. Now, not everything a child does is laid at the parent's feet. There can be a good person that raises a horrible child, it could be a horrible child that comes up and raised by good, pe good people. All these things can happen. But in this case, Eli was directly responsible for the way his kids went. They made themselves vile. And Eli refused to destroy. He saw it. He knew they were going the wrong way, but he didn't do what he needed to to correct it. Why not? Maybe he was too busy. Maybe he was too occupied with other people's kids. But the bottom line was he needed to know that he was responsible for what happened to those boys. Now, Eli rebuked them, but he did not restrain them from their sins. Well, 
James Dobson has some good stuff out there. And here's what he says, and it's biblical. There is security in defined limits. When the home atmosphere is like it should be, the child lives in safety. He never gets in trouble unless he deliberately asks for it. As long as he stays within the boundaries, there is beauty and wonder and joy, freedom and acceptance. But he needs to know when he crosses that line what waits on the other side. One writer says permissiveness is the principle of treating children as if they were adults and the tactic of making sure that they never reach that stage. You know, that's the idea of the wrong type of discipline. In Colossians 3.21, fathers do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged or disheartened and hate God, basically. Hebrews 12.1, chastening does not uh, seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those that have been trained by it. In Hebrews 12, 5 and 6, have you forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as sons? Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens, and He scourges every son whom He receives. Now, again, we're talking about disciplining a child as God would have you to do it, not with the idea of going out and trying to destroy that child or hurt that child or to show that child that you're more powerful than they are. Something wrong with that. In Psalm 103, verses 13 through 14, here's the attitude. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those that fear Him. For He knows our frame, and He remembers that we are as dust. Remember what it's like to be a child and mess up? You remember that? Don't forget that. Recognize that your children are looking to you for the guidance that they need to have. David had the attitude, search me and try me, O God, and understand my thoughts even afar off, and correct me according to thy loving kindness. Correct me. That's what children should want and expect from their parents, <clears throat> is that they'll be corrected from the course they're following if it's the wrong course. God put you here to do that. Not to be mean, not to try to destroy, but to try to build the type of child that needs to be on this earth. Our task as parents, so Dobson says, is not to eliminate every challenge from our children. It's to serve as a confident ally on their behalf, encouraging when they're distressed, intervening when the threats are overwhelming, and giving them the tools they need to overcome the obstacles of life. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you, but that is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted more than you can take, but will with the temptation have way of escape that you might be able to bear up under it. 1 Corinthians 13, 7, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. You know what? children need to recognize that sometimes they're a great bother to their parents and cause their children, their parents a great deal of problems. And as you get older you realize that. And you look back at your parents and you wonder, how were they so patient with me? When you're little children you don't recognize that until you've had your own children and see that. So we need to understand that we need to raise our children not to keep you may be watching tonight. Maybe you're a, a child that's one of those boomerang children. You keep coming back home. You know what? The Lord wants you to fly. He wants you to go out of the nest. You're not shoving parents. You're not shoving them out of the nest. You're teaching them to fly. And so let your children learn how to fly on their own, or they'll be forever hampered by dependence upon you. Someone asked us one time, does it bother you to be away from your children and miles apart? I said, no, we didn't raise them to keep. Do I miss them every day? Yes. But we did not raise our children to be right underneath our feet, nor should any parent. Part of our training is to raise them to move on and to start their own life. Now we'll begin again next week on this same subject and talking about midlife. We hear a lot about midlife. 
Oh, that's a challenge. The kids are out of the nest and now we're on our own. And what are we going to do with our life? And a lot of people talk about midlife crisis and all that type of thing. But we're going to talk about what the Bible says about that time of our lives. And then we're going to talk about those of you who may be a little older. We're going to talk about the aging years. What about those who are older to those who are in their retirement years? Does the Bible speak to us of it in any way? Do we just give up? Are we done? Is it all over? Or are there things that we can do? You see, in every stage of our lives that we're looking at, there are things that God expects of us that we thrive at during those times. Being a child, the Lord says there's joy, innocence, trust that we never get rid of. Also, as we get to be teenagers, there's some admirable things about teenagers, remembering our Creator in our youth. And then also, as we get to be adults, there's admirable traits there where we see that the things that we have learned, practiced, then we move on to marriage and to children, and we begin to do the cycle all over again and raising up another generation. Beautiful things there. And it's a wonderful life that we live. And there are great things to be enjoyed in each phase of our lives. But notice the modifier of it all is putting God first in everything that we do. We teach our children from a young age. We are taught at a young age, hopefully. But at some point in our lives, if we're not taught, we see the beauty of that. And we value the truth of it. And we put it into practice in our lives and train our children in those ways that maybe we weren't trained in. We thank you so much for watching tonight. You've been a very good audience, and we hope that you've enjoyed our study together tonight and some things that kind of hit us where we live. And we'll continue next week on this on the subject, and we'll uh, end our show with that. I want you to know that uh, the Newton Church of Christ sponsors this program. And if you would like to study the Bible in your home, you please let us know, and we will be more than glad to do just that, to study the Bible with you. Going to heaven is the most important thing in life, folks. Are you headed that way? And if you're not, how can we help you? Please let us. Let us take God's Word, sit down together, see what God's Word says, and let's all abide by what God says, because He's much wiser than all of us. He knows the answers, and He's given us those answers. The things that He wants us to do to go to heaven, He has told us. We want to thank you again for your time. It's valuable. We know that, and we appreciate it. Come be with us in two weeks as we conclude our study together on the stages of our lives. And thank you so much for your time, and good evening.